Welcome. My name is Ross Emmett, and I am the director of the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty at Arizona State University. Today's event is the first of this year's Perspectives on Economic Liberty webinars, sponsored by the Center. The Center is part of Arizona State's School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership, as well as the W.P. Carey School of Business, and has the mission of evaluating the contribution of economic liberty to human betterment. It's our privilege to have as our speaker today, Matt Ridley, who has recently written the book, How Innovation Works and Why It Flourishes in Freedom. Here's a picture of it here, but you can also see it over Matt's right shoulder when he, he starts speaking. That argues that one of the most important ways that economic liberty contributes to human betterment is by creating the context for innovation to flourish. Some of you will know Matt from his previous books, his bestsellers, The Rational Optimist and Genome, or perhaps his National Academies of Science award-winning book, The Agile Gene. But for those of you who will hear him today for the first time, let me mention that he is the fifth Viscount Ridley and was elected as a hereditary peer to the British House of Lords in 2013. He remains active in the House of Lords. In the same year, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences after winning the Julian Simon Award from the Competitive Enterprise Institute in 2012. Just today, the Competitive Enterprise Institute announced its 2020 winner, who is former visitor to the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty, Stephen Horowitz. While he is noted, while um, Matt Ridley is noted as a major to con contributor to public engagement with the biological sciences, I would dare to say that his focus on how human engagement in markets enables us to collaborate together to improve our prospects for prosperity is another of his very important contributions. Before I turn things over to Matt, a, a word about our format. Matt will speak for 20 minutes and then we'll turn to questions. If you wish to ask a question, please enter the question in the Q&A feature that you can see at the bottom of the screen. The, uh, the Zoom window. The questions will be collected and will be forwarded to me to ask Matt. Matt will have a final wrap up and I will close at the end of the hour with an announcement about upcoming events from the center. So Matt, we're delighted to have you with us and I'm gonna turn things over to you now. Thank you, Ross, very much indeed uh, for that kind introduction. And I thought I would just mention that here is the Julian Simon Award that I won in 2012. Uh, and it's made of the five metals that were involved in the bet between Julian Simon and Paul Ehrlich, famously. Um, it's great to be with you today, um, or rather, it's great to be virtually with you because I'm in the north of England, you're in Arizona. Uh, and that is one of the miracles of innovation, is that we are able, as we probably wouldn't have been just 10 years ago, uh, to conduct a, an interactive seminar, as I hope this will be, uh, despite the great distance between us. What a remarkable and magical thing that that would seem to even uh, people of from two or three generations ago, let alone more than that. And to illustrate the point of my book, I'd like to just start with a little story because the point of the book is to say that innovation is the lifeblood of economic growth. It is what causes us to be better off than our ancestors. It is the main event, if you like, of the modern world. And yet it's somewhat mysterious. We don't fully understand why it happens when and where it does um, or why it happens to us and not to other creatures uh, at all, or at least to, to the same extent. Um, but the story I wanted to tell is that in the 1990s, it was widely agreed that, uh, the, uh, that malaria was going to kill more people in the 21st century than uh, before. And that was because it was increasing. Malaria mortality was increasing, and climate change was going to enabled mosquitoes to have longer breeding seasons and so on. And so it looked like malaria was a growing problem in the world. In the year 2003, malaria mortality stopped increasing and immediately started decreasing. And it has since then dropped so steeply that uh, mortality has halved. 
um, some half a million people a year are now uh, not dying of malaria that would have been dying 15 years ago. What was the cause of that switch? And the answer is a simple innovation, a low-tech uh, innovation, the insecticide-treated bed net. That was the year in which the Gates Foundation particularly and others began pushing this technology, um, particularly in Africa. And uh, I, tr I wanted to trace back, where did that idea come from? Who decided that that technology was the way to tackle malaria? Because it has, it has been twice as effective as anti-malarial drugs and mosquito control pesticides uh, put together in terms of reducing malaria mortality. Uh, and I eventually tracked it back to a very simple experiment done in a, a series of experimental mud huts set up for the purpose in Burkina Faso in uh, Western Africa in 1983. A uh, very simple, very well designed experiment which proved that an insecticide treated bed net was a huge deterrent to mosquitoes, that they tried to leave the hut if they uh, detected that this thing was there and that it didn't matter if the, the net had tears in it. Um, it. It didn't have to be intact, which an untreated net generally had to be. Um, so it's a very nice example of going from a simple experiment, albeit with a delay of 20 years, to a massive impact uh, upon the world. This is one of the great killers of the world, and it's being defeated by this simple innovation. I tell lots of stories like this in the book. Part of my object is to entertain people rather than just to inform them. And so what I wanted to do was tell stories that brought to life the immediacy of what innovation does. And then I, towards the end of the book, I start drawing the lessons from these stories uh, and try to distill out what I call innovation's essentials, the features of it that make it uh, a characteristic. I'm not trying to look for universal laws, but I am trying to look for patterns about how innovation works. And here are a few of the essentials that I pull out, and I'll illustrate them as I go through with one or two of the stories that I tell. I argue that innovation is very different from invention. They're both important. You need to invent new things, but you also need to roll them out. You need to, to make technologies available, reliable, and affordable for people. And that's the hard slog of innovation that often gets neglected. Um, people think that if you invent a beat better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. But that's not always the case. You can have a better mousetrap, and because you haven't made it reliable or affordable uh, or found a way of mass producing it, or indeed alerted the world to its existence, then it may not uh, take off at all. So I very much in the book uh, focus on innovation rather than invention and, and argue that we've perhaps been too excited about the individual inventor who, like Archimedes, jumps out of the bath and runs down the street shouting Eureka, and not given enough attention to the Edisons and Jeff Bezoses who have turned ideas into practical realities that affect our lives. I argue that innovation is a more gradual process than we think. We tend to think in terms of disruptive innovation, big breakthroughs that change the world. But when you look closely, you find that actually even they, the, the, the breakthrough moment is prece preceded by a lot of preparatory work and experimental work and is succeeded by a lot of work to improve the technology. So if you look at something like Moore's law, Moore's law is the gradual improvement in computing technology over decades, identified first in the mid 1960s by Gordon Moore. And the weird thing about Moore's law is that once he spotted it, it continued to work. In other words, even though we knew computing power for a unit price was going to double every 18 months, we couldn't jump ahead and get there now. We had to invent each uh, uh, scale of miniaturization of integrated circuits before we could invent the next. And indeed, if you extrapolate backwards and you look at the point where the integrated circuit replaced the transistor and the transistor replaced the vacuum tube, there is no jump. There is no step up in the improvement. It's just a slightly better than the old technology which is then slightly better in the next technology. So the more you look at innovation, the more it actually looks gradual, even if it can result in some very big changes in society. And in that sense, it's also evolutionary. 
That is to say, you find descent with modification. You know, the, the motor car is the offspring of the railway uh, locomotive and uh, the horse cart with a little bit of uh, ancestor for, of the bicycle thrown in there too. And they, these, these things often start off looking like their ancestors and then change uh, their appearance as time goes on. And you can very clearly trace these evolutionary patterns through technology, just as you can through biological uh, uh, organisms. Evolution is serendipitous, and by that mean there's quite a lot of luck involved. Um, you often need to have a change of direction. You often en end up innovating something that's different from what you thought you were innovating. So Kevlar, Teflon, and the post-it note were all uh, developed by people looking for something else. Uh, in the case of um, uh, Teflon, uh, the, the guy was really disappointed. He'd produced this stuff that wasn't what he wanted. He wanted a liquid. He'd got a solid. He didn't know what to do with it. And then he realized that it had this extraordinary non-stick quality that was useful. In the case of the post-it note, the guys at 3M who invented that, they were looking for a strong glue that worked with paper permanently. They found a temporary glue that worked with paper. Again, they were disappointed. And then one of them went to choir practice and he thought, hang on, I can mark the place in my hymn book with this technology. Evolution, uh, sorry, innovation is recombinant. That is to say, like evolution, it tends to work not by inventing things from scratch, but by recombining existing technologies in new forms. So my favorite example of this is a thing called the pill camera, which takes a picture of your insides if you swallow it. And it came about after a conversation over a garden fence between a gastroenterologist and a guided missile designer. That's what I mean by recombination of new technologies. And Brian Arthur at Stanford has argued that it's impossible to think of any technology we have today that is not a combination of other technologies. Evolution, sorry, innovation, like evolution, depends heavily on trial and error. Natural selection, we call it in the case of evolution. And if you, if you ask innovators what really matters in what they are doing, they often emphasize trial and error. The, the importance of making mistakes and learning from them, the importance of changing direction, the importance of just trying things again and again, of not knowing what the right step is, the next step. You've got to try lots of different experiments. You've got to try thousands of different things. The difference between Thomas Edison and the other people working on light bulbs in the 1870s was that Edison realized the importance of trial and error. And he got his team to test 6,000 different types of plant to find the perfect stuff to make the filament of the light bulb out of that would last a long time. And he eventually settled on a kind of Japanese bamboo. 6,000, that's the, that's the scale of the sort of um, sheer slog that you've got to do to turn these things into practical inventions. Innovation is a team sport too. That is to say, it's not these brilliant individuals who sit in an ivory tower and have a great thought. Um, if you take the uh, invention of the aeroplane, for example, there were two guys who tried to get into the air on the east coast of the United States in December 1903. Uh, one of them was called Samuel Langley, and he was a brilliant uh, astronomer, and he was widely connected, and he was head of the Smithsonian Institution, and he had an enormous grant from the U.S. government, and his aeroplane was a complete flop. It literally fell straight into the Potomac River. Um, and the reason was because he'd worked on his own in secret. And he said, I'm going to design this from scratch. And he'd done no experiments until he produced the final result. Well, almost none. And by contrast, the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk had been experimenting with gliders for years at this point. Uh, and they'd been communicating voluminously with anyone anywhere in the world who was interested in, in flight, uh, who were building gliders or whatever it might be. Uh, and they'd gathered uh, uh, information. They realized that, that, that they needed to draw upon the collective wisdom of the world, not just uh, their own uh, insights and ideas. There's something inexorable about innovation once it gets started. 21 different people 
came up with the idea of the light bulb independently in the 1870s. That seems really bizarre, as if some deity had reached down from the clouds and implanted the idea of the light bulb in 21 different people. There was Edison in the US, there was Swan in England, there was Lodigan in Russia, etc., etc. But actually what was happening there was that the technologies you needed to combine to make a light bulb had reached the point where it was inevitable that people would do it. The, the technology of glass blowing, the technology of vacuum creation, the technology of, above all, electricity use. Um, and, and it was known that a glowing filament would work in a, in a vacuum. So people were on the case and they were bound to get there. Uh, and it, an even more recent example is the search engine. Lots of different people came up with search engines in the early 1990s. If Sergey Brin had never met Larry Page to found Google, then we would still have search engines. Um, they might not be called Google, but we would still definitely have search engines. You can't prevent the invention of the search engine in the early 1990s. So it's very inexorable. But here's the weird thing. Nobody saw it coming. In the late 1980s, when the internet was being developed, it should have been obvious that search would be quite a big part of the e-commerce once the internet got going, that it might even be the way to make money out of the internet, as it turned out to be. But very few people saw that. And indeed, Larry Page and Sergey Brin didn't see that. They thought they were cataloging the internet. They didn't realize they were inventing a very lucrative thing called a search engine. There's a curious feature of innovation that I think is very important, which is that and, and it goes, I call it the Amara hype cycle, because a guy called Roy Amara in California in the 1960s was the first one to spot this. Uh, he said that we underestimate the impact of a new technology in the long run, but we overestimate it in the short run. So lots of technologies, including the internet, when you think about it, were kind of disappointing for the first 10, 15 years. And then after that, they certainly were not disappointing. Uh, genomics is probably has been disappointing in the 20 years since the 2000 and the first reading of the human genome at least by the standard of the hopes placed in it then but i suspect it is about to be very much not disappointing as a technology so that's one of the things that makes it very hard to forecast technology because uh, you things that look unimportant and slow and disappointing can suddenly turn into mega successes uh, in the next decade. And that often catches people out. Innovation prefers fragmented governance. It doesn't like empires. The empires ought to be great for innovation. They have huge free trade areas. They have one rule across the whole uh, uh, empire. Um, uh, they often have a lot of money available, uh, particularly at the center. And yet they're terrible uh, at innovation. The Ottoman Empire, the Ming Empire in China, almost no innovation uh, at all coming out of these places. The Roman Empire was not a very inventive place. It was very good at doing what it did, but it did not come up with many new technologies. Whereas the Greek city-states, the Italian city-states, the, the, the low countries, um, uh, the, the, the cities of Northern Britain, and more recently, the American states, uh, which are different laboratories from each other, have proved to be very successful uh, innovators, despite being not very well unified, not all run by the same um, master. And the exception that proves this rule, in my view, uh, is the Song dynasty in China. Around a thousand years ago, China was very, very inventive. It came up with lots of new technologies such as uh, paper money and printing and the compass and gunpowder and all these things. And this was a period called the Song Dynasty, but it wasn't really a dynasty. It was a fragmented uh, uh, rule. Uh, it was very devolved. Local towns and cities basically ran themselves uh, under a, a light touch uh, empire. And the Ming comes along and changes this with a Mongol interruption before it. Uh, and it's never the same again. It kills the goose that lays the golden egg. And I think something similar goes on within corporations. When they get big and monopolistic, they often become much less innovative. On the whole, innovation happens in small companies. Look at what happened to Kodak. Kodak actually did invent 
digital photography, but it didn't like to destroy its own business by uh, investing in this rival technology. And it thought it's never going to be as good as film, so we'll ignore it. Uh, and as a result, it was swept away when digital photography became much better. One of the important things about innovation, I think, is that it's important to see it as the seed of science as well as the fruit of science. We often talk about it as being the fruit of science. That is to say, you do scientific research in a university, in an academic setting, and you then spin something out into the real world as an application of that research. And that does happen. But just as often, it happens the other way around, that in industry, people tinker and experiment and come up with something that works, and they then go back to academia and say, can you explain to me what's going on here? That happened with the dye industry and chemistry. It happened with the steam engine and thermodynamics. It happened with vaccination, except that we uh, developed and used vaccination as an innovation for several hundred years before we even began to understand it. So... Uh, and a very modern example of this is gene editing, the new technology for very precisely altering the sequences of genomes. And CRISPR is the particular technology I'm talking about here. And if you look at where CRISPR comes from, you find that there's a big rivalry between MIT and Berkeley over who has the, right, the intellectual property and who's going to get the Nobel Prize. This looks like a classic academic story. But dig a little deeper and you find that actually where these guys got the idea from was research in the yogurt industry into the defenses in bacteria against viruses where they discovered this system uh, of sequences and, and enzymes that stored the DNA of viruses so as to recognize what to attack. Uh, this, th this had been investigated in the yogurt industry uh, for some years before people began to realize that it could be adapted to use for uh, gene editing uh, in other creatures. It's a myth that innovation destroys employment. People have been worried about this for several hundred years since the Luddites in uh, the Industrial Revolution in, in England. Uh, and every few decades, it comes around again. In the early 1960s, there was a presidential commission which concluded that because of automation, because of computers in factories, it was not going to be possible for all Americans to have jobs in the future. We were going to have to share out the leisure uh, because there wasn't going to be enough work to go around. And you've heard similar things said in recent years about artificial intelligence. Only this time, it's the lawyers, not the factory workers, who are going to lose their jobs. Um, and of course, automation does displace some uh, work, but it always creates more. I mean, if you brought someone back from, from the 19th century and you tried to explain to them what jobs people do today, most of the professions would be baffling. You know, what is a flight attendant? What is a software engineer? You know, I mean, th these things would not make sense to people from previous generations. So that illustrates how uh, we actually create more work uh, out of innovation rather than less. It's true we can have shorter working lives, shorter working weeks, and also stay in uh, education longer and also have longer periods of retirement as a result of innovation. Um, but uh, there is no sign that we will create mass unemployment as a result of this. Another myth is that infinite innovation and growth in a finite world is impossible. Now, I say that's a myth because when you think about it, there is a huge amount of shrinkage going on as a result of economic growth. Things get smaller. The, the amount of uh, aluminum in a drinks can is 13% of what it once was. Uh, the amount of land you need to produce a given amount of food is 68% smaller than it was 50 years ago. Um, the uh, the, the, the a device that fits in your pocket can be not just a telephone, but a camera and a compass and a flashlight and a diary and all these different things. So there's a, there's a huge amount of, uh, of doing more with less, of using fewer resources to produce more outcomes. And if in the future we decide that's all we want to do, we only want to have the kind of growth that comes from shrinkage, more from less, in the, in the words of Andrew McAfee, who's written a book about this, uh, then there's no, nothing to stop us continuing to grow indefinitely by doing that. And indeed, 
the US economy and curiously the UK economy have both passed peak stuff. That is to say, the stuff we produce and the stuff we import in terms of minerals, metals, things like that, if you add it all up, we're using less every year, not more. Not per head, overall we're using less, um, despite the fact that our economies are growing and our populations are growing. We're using less steel in buildings or in cars, etc., etc. The final point, and the one that intersects with uh, what your uh, group does, Ross, uh, is that I in the end, looking at all these features of innovation, the one theme that underlies pretty well all of them is that innovation flourishes in freedom. It is not possible to have an innovative economy without freedom. The freedom of the consumer to express his wishes, very important, but also the freedom of the entrepreneur to invest where he thinks he's going to get a return, the freedom to fail, and start again, the freedom to change direction, the freedom to do trial and error, uh, the freedom to uh, think of new ideas, which is terribly important. And again, I want to go to China to sort of make this point, because you can see how freedom mattered in Victorian England or in modern California. But why are we having innovation in China, which is not a free place at all? And the answer is, until recently, it was free, at least economically. It was not politically free. You were not free to start a political party in China any time in the last 50 years. But if you wanted to start a business or invent a new widget or innovate and develop a new technique for doing something, there was very little to stop you. You didn't have to go through the same bureaucratic hoops as you did in the West. Uh, and this was the compromise that Deng Xiaoping essentially uh, gave China uh, starting in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Um, and uh, the result of it was a surprising amount of freedom below the level of political freedom. Now, I think that era is over. I think the Xi Jinping regime is not free on any level and is increasingly trying to be dirigiste uh, about the economy as well as the politics. And as a result, I am forecasting that the Chinese economy will not be as innovative uh, over the next uh, few decades as it has been over the last few decades. If that's the case, are we going to find somewhere else that picks up the baton and becomes uh, free uh, and innovative. I hope so. Whether it'll be the West, I don't know. Whether it'll be India. Somewhere in the world, we need to keep this torch alive because it is a spectacular um, source of prosperity and health and wealth for people. Thank you, uh, Ross. I've gone on slightly too long, and I apologize. Well, thank you for those, <clears throat> for those comments, uh, Matt. We appreciate it, and it was a fascinating list, and I appreciated the closure on the theme of economic liberty and the challenge that uh, we are presented here in the future. Um, we're, we're gonna proceed with some questions. I have a, a couple to start with, and um, then we'll be turning to the audience questions. So for the audience, please remember to put your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, not in the chat, and uh, those will be vetted uh, to uh, come to me uh, to ask. Um, so the, the first question is one that connects with your discussion about uh, universities, the uh, invention, innovation connection, and things like that, and that is the patent system. <clears throat> Are, is it necessary to have something like patents for there to be innovation? And um, you know, maybe that it's relevant in some areas and not others. Um, or should we just like get rid of the patent system altogether, even though it's for the US, it's enshrined in the US Constitution, uh, and, and in fact was put there to promote the public knowledge of, um, of what was being invented, but it certainly has uh, perhaps outlived that purpose. So the patent system, what do you think? Well, um, superficially, 
it looks right that you should give people uh, monopolistic rewards in their inventions so that they are encouraged to go out and innovate. Um, the patent system is intended to encourage innovation. But does it do so? I'm very skeptical. If you look at the empirical evidence of countries that strengthened their patent system, did not see an uptick in innovation. Countries that, that weakened their uh, patent system did not see a downtick in innovation. Look at something like copyright in music, which was largely destroyed by streaming a short generation ago and has not seen any diminution in the amount of people creating music. Um, look at what happens when a patent expires. Um, the expiry of the patent on corrugated iron is something I write about in the book, a very simple technology, but a very important one. Uh, it resulted in a flourishing of new uses of that technology after the patent expired. Same thing has happened much more recently with 3D printing. Some key patents on 3D printing expired uh, a couple of years ago, and you suddenly saw a great burst of innovation uh, in 3D printing. So on the whole, I am very skeptical about the patent system. There is lots of evidence that it is actually getting in the way rather than helping. There are patent thickets that entrepreneurs have to find their way through. There are patent trolls who exist only to exploit the profits of patents, not to use them for innovation, and so on. Uh, and I think, but I will admit that going cold turkey from here on in, onto a no patent system would be very difficult. Uh, and uh, so I think what we need to do is try to examine ways in which we can shorten the lives of patents. We can have different categories of patents, patents that are much harder to get but give you more protection and much easier to get but give you less protection. Um, if you look at the software industry over the last 50 years, patents have been very unimportant. That is to say, if you invent a new uh, uh, software program or you know, something like one-click ordering on Amazon, um, you don't get much benefit out of patenting it. You might get a couple of years of monopoly profits, but uh, within a year or two, people are going to find their way around it and you're going to be uh, looking at your competitors moving ahead of you. What you have to be in that world is a first mover and you know, you're better than your competitors. You're not, you're not denying them access to your technology. You're just doing it better. And that's, I think, what the world should be like. Now, we could talk about the special case of drugs where we want you to spend a billion dollars proving it's safe and efficacious before you can have it. And it does seem a bit unfair if you do that, that you shouldn't have uh, some profits from it. So there are, there are subtleties here, but on the whole, I am very skeptical of the importance of patents. Because they're called intellectual property, we think they are like real property rights, but actually they're not, they're very different beasts. You celebrate um, innovation as a market success, but uh, the argument has been made recently over the last well, close to at least 10 years, if not longer, that innovation is a, uh, a case of market failure, that because innovators don't reap the, the, all the rewards of their innovations, that uh, there's insufficient amounts of innovation. And hence, uh, as uh, The Economist once hosted a, um, a, um, an international panel uh, discussing the question, you know, should government be the driver of innovation? So what do you think about arguments about innovation as a case of market failure, the necessity for um, larger scale for government or other entities to step up? And of course, this is part of uh, Maria Mazzucato's book, uh, The Entrepreneurial State. And I just wonder, um, what's your kind of response to that argument about market failure is? Um, well, uh, I don't find that argument persuasive um, because if you look at what's happened in, uh, e.g. the digital industries on the West Coast of the US over the last 50 years, um, there doesn't seem to have been a failure. There seems to have been huge success. Now, was that because the state was investing? Not really. Uh, 
Sure, the state seeded some of the early stuff through uh, Defense Department grants to universities and things like that. But on the whole, that only really took off when they left those universities or left those uh, DARPA uh, labs and went and started things like Xerox PARC or, right. or Microsoft or Google or whatever. Um, so there doesn't seem to be a lack of incentives in the market for an innovator to, to, uh, to go out and do something. Look at Amazon. You know, Jeff Bezos... Uh, has, is, a, is an innovator. I wouldn't call him an inventor, but I would call him an innovator. And he has created much more than anyone else, a system of e-commerce, of online retail that we all use, and a whole lot of other things, including Amazon Web Services. He's done so with a lot of failure along the way. He's the first to admit that. Um, uh, and he hasn't, had, I don't think, had a cent of, uh, well, he may have, you know, there may be tax incentives and things we can talk about, but it's, it's not, that's not created by government at all. And I think this idea that innovation doesn't happen because the market doesn't reward it, and therefore the state has to step in and do it, is a myth. Uh, I mean, if you go back uh, to the early 20th century, who's the most innovative economy in the world in the 1920s, 1930s? Well, it would be the US, actually. At that stage, the US is funding zero research and development. The US government is funding zero research and development, whereas China, France and Germany are, defending, uh, are funding quite a lot. So it, it, the, the pattern you're looking for, that the government needs to help stimulate in innovation, doesn't show up anywhere in history. Um, and I'm very critical of Mazzucato's book uh, in one section of my book, because I think uh, she, uh, I mean, she argues, for example, that, you know, look at the railways. They improve because governments invent, invest in them. They wouldn't improve if you didn't have government labs doing railway investments. Well, I'm sorry, but the golden age of railways was the 90, was the 1840s uh, when uh, there was the railway boom in the UK and thousands of miles of railroad were built in the US and so on. Um, there wasn't a cent of government money anywhere near that or indeed government direction. Uh, um, the only thing the government occasionally had to do was pass laws to, to allow uh, railroad companies to buy up land or something like that. Um, so um, I don't find it persuasive that, uh, that, 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 that this is a case of uh, market failure. I can come on to the question of whether or not we're seeing too much or too little innovation today. And I, on the whole, I argue that we are in a bit of an innovation famine. If you leave the digital world to one side, we aren't uh, changing our technologies fast enough or, or effectively enough. And one of the big reasons is government regulation getting in the way of innovation in, for example, the nuclear industry and, in, for example, the biotechnology industry, etc. Thank you. <clears throat> Turning to some of the audience questions. I have a question from Jeff Mather in the UK, um, home territory for you. How would you sum up or uh, what, what are the ways that a country can, uh, so the turning the, the previous question around, what are the, the ways that a country can become fertile ground for innovation? It's a really good question. And uh, I, I would say that a government that recognizes the importance of freedom, freedom to experiment, uh, essentially, uh, is absolutely vital to this. And one of the, the, the secrets for me is nimble, fast decision-making by bureaucracies. Uh, again and again, I came across cases where it's not that government is saying no to things, uh, but that it takes an age to say yes. We never banned fracking in the UK but we took seven years to say we're not sure. Um, and that wasn't, you know, that destroyed a very good potential technology uh, coming to the UK, similar with biotechnology. Um, so uh, speed of decision-making by the state is I think something that, that is uh, underestimated in its importance. And I would like to see that, that emphasized more. There are other things, but that's a, a good one to start with. A second question from uh, here um, at Arizona State from Clay Tenquist. Besides the uh, Gates Foundation gift to help cure malaria, 
Uh, what other innovations uh, do you know of that were uh, the result of philanthropic investment? Well, uh, a, a, another Gates one, a very nice one actually, because it, it, it comes back to this patent story, um, is the pertussis vaccine. Sorry, not the pertussis vaccine, the pneumococcus vaccine. A few years ago, the Gates Foundation identified pneumococcus as a significant killer of children in poor countries in the tropics. Uh, and it went to the pharmaceutical industry and said, why haven't you developed a vaccine for this? And they said, because it's not profitable, because uh, kids are, uh, in the tropics don't, don't pay. Um, and Gates said, well, what if we gave you a prize for developing this vaccine? But instead of the prize being a lump sum, you know, a pat on the head and a billion dollars, how about uh, the prize being every time you make and sell one of these vaccines, we will bump up the, the, the price you receive. So the, the, the kid in the third world will receive it for a cheap price, but you will get three times that price because we will pay the difference. Um, an advanced market commitment, it was called. Uh, and it worked like a dream. Three companies quickly developed um, pneumococcus vaccines. They have already saved three quarters of a million lives, it's reckoned. Um, it's a very successful, very recent story. And it tells me that we need to do more with prizes. Because the great thing about prizes, they're agnostic about who's, who, who wins until they've won. Before that, if government gets involved saying, look, I, I can see the need for decarbonization or vaccine development or whatever, I'm going to back this horse. Um, well, government notoriously is very bad at picking winners and losers are very good at picking government um, to fund them. Uh, whereas a prize, which you give after the event, albeit you promise it before the event, uh, works rather well because it only goes to the winner. Um, so I think that's a better system than patents uh, or subsidies for encouraging innovation. And I don't think we do enough with it. It goes right back to the Longitude Prize in the 18th century, which uh, is a good example because what happened there was John Harrison came forward and won the prize, not without a lot of complaining from people who didn't want to give him the prize. The prize committee didn't want to give him the prize because he'd solved the problem of how to measure longitude at sea by building a better clock. And everyone said, don't be ridiculous. We were looking for an astronomical solution. We, you know, we wanted you to be able to look at the stars and work out where you are. And he said, no, all you need is a really good clock that works on a ship. And then you know what time it is in London and you know what time it is where you are because you can see the sun uh, and the difference will tell you your longitude. Um, so it was a very serendipitous discovery. And again, it was the, the longitude prize that, that led to that. Um, also from Arizona State here, um, Professor Sean Klein. Um, given the constraints you identified for innovation in nuclear power, um, what hope is there of expanding its use? I'm quite bullish about nuclear power, but, but I may be wrong. And I'll tell you where I'm getting excited, and that is Canada. Uh, the Canadians... Um, uh, have a, a nuclear regulator that is much more open to being principles-based rather than um, technology-based. So the U.S. regulator has basically become a regulator of uh, pressurized water reactors. It only has expertise in that area, and it likes to drill down into every detail of those. And if you go along to it and say, I haven't got a pressurized water reactor, uh, I've got a uh, a molten salt reactor. They say, sorry, we haven't got the expertise for that. We'll have to build it up. That'll take 10 years and cost you a billion, billion dollars. Um, whereas the Canadians are, are taking a much more flexible approach. So there's something like 10 different projects in Canada to try and get what so-called generation four nuclear um, projects uh, up and running there. And some of them, terrestrial energy, Moltex, others are showing real promise, I think. Um, they're working with low enriched uranium, which has all sorts of advantages in terms of cost. Um, uh, they're, 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 they're producing reactors that are going to be much cheaper, that are going to, they produce higher heat, which means you can run your turbines at higher efficiency. So you can get, you know, 50% um, energy conversion instead of 30%. Um, that means you can switch it 
ramp it up and down more uh, more easily um, well that's another reason means you can do that which means they can work alongside renewables so i'm very hopeful that molten salt reactors will transform the picture because at the moment what we've done is we've created a regulation monster in the nuclear industry um, whereby we regulate the project in such a way that we don't allow for experiment it's impossible to do trial and error in a nuclear design well you don't want error obviously on a major scale in nuclear but that's one of the reasons why nobody essentially since the late 1980s nobody's tried a new design because the regulator will say to you uh, if, if you go to them and say five years in we've decided actually we don't want to build it this way we want to build it slightly differently we want to use a different material or something the regulator say well in that case you've got to start the regulatory process all over again uh, and that's what causes these enormous delays uh, if you do that and so as a result you build them like egyptian pyramids one at a time and with um uh with known technologies you don't do any innovation and i haven't mentioned fusion i'm quite excited about fusion too <laughs> um, the next question is about um, whether or not we're, you mentioned that perhaps we're in a little bit of a stagnation on innovation. Um, and um, the, so that, that, that question is picked up here. You know, should we be concerned about the stagnation of innovation? Um, you know, I, adding my own twist to this question, Robert Gordon, the famous economic historian, argued that uh, you know there are no great next steps of innovation possible we had the you know we had the steam age and the digital age and the like and uh, so you know should we expect shouldn't we be expecting you know new um, new cars or things that will make cars obsolete etc yeah yeah it's a really good point and you know robert gordon um, is echoed by Peter Thiel when he said we wanted flying cars and we got 140 characters. Uh, you know, a lot of what we're inventing these days is is pretty trivial. Uh, you know, it's new video games, new social media. Uh, it's not the toilet or the um, locomotive or uh, the internal combustion engine or the airplane or you know any of these things that really do change our lives dramatically. Um, and yes, I do think we are experiencing a, a, a period of slow innovation particularly if you leave aside what's happening in uh, on the internet as it were if you look at the world of atoms rather than the world of bits we aren't very innovative these days um, uh, i don't agree that that's because we've run out of things to invent of importance i think a flying car or efficient battery or something would be fantastic. It would be great to have it. It's not that, that, that there's nothing there to invent uh, or to innovate. It's um, that we have put barriers in the way of innovation. If you look at what's happening in the turnover of companies, in the, 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 the way entrepreneurs displace existing companies, in the age of entrepreneurs, we're living in a rather stagnant, conservative time. Um, the turnover has really slowed down. Uh, the challenge to incumbents is not as strong. And that's because incumbents have put barriers to entry in the way. And the digital industry is now doing this. I mean, look at GDPR, the European Data Protection Regulations, which have acted as a very successful barrier to entry against rivals to Google and Facebook, basically. They're the beneficiaries of this. They've got big departments that can that can comply. And if you look at where the ad revenue is going, it's increasingly going to the big guys since GDPR. So um, uh, there's a real problem of resistance to innovation from big corporations. There's a real problem of resistance to innovation from big governments. And there's a real problem of pressure groups building resistance to innovation and fanning the flames of technophobia. Um, I'm talking you know, about the resistance to biotechnology, for example, uh, that Greenpeace uh, does a lot to ferment. Um, uh, so those are, in my view, the reasons we're not seeing uh, enough, as much innovation as we could. And does it matter? Oh, yes, it does. Look at the year 2020 and the pandemic of COVID. 
we entered that with no good vaccine development platform and without point of care portable diagnostic DNA testing devices. Um, why? I mean, we could have had point of care testing DNA diagnostic devices years ago. Um, why not? Well, if you go and look at medical device regulation, you find it takes many, many months, 40 months, 70 months in some countries to get licensed. And if you're an entrepreneur sitting around, shall I invent a DNA test that is portable and at the bedside? Or shall I go and do a new video game? Well, one is easy, permissionless, and you don't need to, to, to wade through regulations. The other takes many years and your, your venture capital investors lose patience. So that's why we haven't, you know, that's why it matters that we haven't had enough innovation. A few years ago, Gates Foundation and Wellcome Trust got together and set up something called the Coalition, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, which is about having vaccine platforms ready to go when a pandemic threatens. And it's a really good idea. It only started in 2017 and it's not up and running yet. That should have been done 10 years ago. It should have been done by the World Health Organization. Um, but uh, it's not been. And as a result, it takes as long to develop a vaccine today as it did in the 1950s. That's pretty shocking. Well, that seems a, a good way to wrap up uh, because uh, the last, the, the question that I had next on the list was the relevance of um, uh, innovation in uh, vaccine development connected to COVID. And uh, you You've just given us the answer to the question of why it may not be uh, as quickly coming as we could hope for. Um, we thank the audience for the questions. We have a few minutes for Matt here to uh, wrap up uh, his, his comments, um, if you would like to. Um, and I'll turn it back to you, Matt, for a couple minutes. Well, uh, thank you very, very much, Ross. It's really nice to, to speak. Thank, thanks for those, those really interesting questions. Um, I don't pretend this book is the last word on innovation, but I do have a chapter in there called The Economics of Innovation. And in it, I argue that we haven't been able to incorporate innovation into our economic uh, models properly. Um, th there's a very, very nice book, um, uh, called Knowledge and the Wealth of Nations uh, by, by David Walsh, which argues that th th there's a contradiction between Adam Smith's two ideas, the idea of the pin factory where uh, innovation results in greater efficiencies and the idea of uh, the invisible hand where um, we eventually find an equilibrium that is as efficient as possible and we drive out uh, all the inefficiencies, but we also we stop innovating. You know, essentially it's a diminishing returns argument versus an increasing returns argument. And he then argues that equilibrium thinking took over economics and spent a century and a half thinking about uh, equilibrium. And as a result, it expected diminishing returns from technology. John Stuart Mill is very explicit about this, and so is uh, so is Keynes. And uh, only Schumpeter is saying, I don't know. I think in innovation may be here to stay. It may go on. It may accelerate even. Um, and then Solo comes along in the 1950s and says, we need to put innovation in our models. It's not in there. It just happens outside our models. Um, and Paul Romer then comes along more recently and, and does endogenous growth theory, which essentially says innovation is a product of investment as well as a cause of uh, investment. And, uh, but we're not there yet. We haven't figured this out. And if, if out there listening to this seminar, there is a brilliant young economist who can develop a theory of innovation I think the world is your oyster. I think we could have a very exciting time exploring that idea. Well, Matt, thank you for your invigorating discussion <clears throat> about innovation. And of course, as the director of the Center for the Study of, of Economic Liberty, um, I'm happy to see how your argument connects to uh, innovation flourishing and freedom. I also want to thank Mason Hunt, who's the project coordinator for the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty, who kept the webinar running smoothly and handled all the questions.
his planning um, and uh, willingness to adapt on the spot um, has made this a success. Uh, I'd like to join, ask you to join us a couple weeks from now on September 23rd at uh, 4 p.m. Arizona time for a webinar that will feature Morris Kleiner of the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs, as well as the center's own Steve Slavinsky, a senior research fellow in the center, to discuss the future of occupational licensing reform as an avenue to post-pandemic prosperity. Then two weeks later on October 8th, I will be hosting a webinar upon the release of the center's Doing Business North America report for 2020, the second edition of uh, the Doing Business North America report, which looks at the ease of doing business in 130 cities across the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Steve Slavinsky will join me that day, as well as Dean Stansel of Southern Methodist University, who's the primary author of the Fraser Institute's Economic Freedom of North America report. The purpose of the webinar, which is in some ways the launch of the second edition of the Doing Business North America report, is to discuss the connections between economic freedom and the ease of doing business in cities across North America. Thank you for being with us today, and um, I wish you all well.